getting me jazzed up. Okay, let's begin. <laughs> So this is going to be a fun presentation. I'm going to look for audience engagement from you. So whenever you see a slide that looks like this, I'm looking for uh, engagement from you. So I would like to ask of you, did anybody recognize that, that piece of audio? Mm. John Cage, that is Correct. So this is John Cage. He was an American composer and music theorist, and he was known for his avant-garde uh, compositions. Something he said, I have nothing to say, and I'm saying it, and that is poetry. The most famous of his compositions you may be familiar with is 433, which is four minutes and 33 seconds of silence as a musician sits next to a piano. So what we just listened to was Imaginary Landscape number four, where he had 12 musicians sit in front of 24 music knobs and just turn them. Because he was looking into what is music. So we're going to let us listen to something else. Practice. Did anybody recognize this? Nothing. Bach. Yes, that was John Sebastian Bach. Thank you. <laughs> so, maybe all of you were born under a Bach. But that is a German-born composer and musician of the Baroque period. So his music is highly regarded for its intellectual depth and its technical command and its artistic beauty. And even though that sounded familiar and comforting, it was actually incredibly complex and organized. So something he did is he created these patterns in his music, um, fugues and canons. And what we have images here, he would take a subject, a, a line of music, and it could be played forwards, and backwards, and forwards and backwards at the same time, and even cut in half, second half reversed, and turned into a Mobius strip. That's how complex, but, but you wouldn't have known by just listening to it. So, maybe some of you are familiar with Frédéric Chopin, and he may have lived a hundred years later, but Chopin revered the music of Bach for its purity and its complexity. And he included Bach's works as essential studies for his students. And he believed that playing Bach helped to develop a, a clear piano touch. And he thought it was important to understand the complex uh, relationships and harmony. So Chopin only has one fugue that he never intended to be published, like a lot of his works. Um, it, it was published uh, posthumously. It is said that Chopin himself used to play box works every day as part of his personal practice. So here we're going to listen to Fugue in A minor, where we can, we can see the influence of Bach. And here is the counter subject. So 
both the subject and the counter subject begin with a very distinctive uh, ascending leap to a perfect fourth. And it ends up sounding like a false entrance to a fugue. Like you can even listen to how similar it sounded to the crab cannon. And this is, some, this is the type of playing that Bach was known for, that each musical composition was almost like a puzzle to the listener. But it was actually, it was a puzzle that was able to be figured out because of patterns. So, now we tell a story, because every good talk has a story, right? Once upon a time at Vouch, there was a team that was very smart and capable, but they had a problem, because every good story starts with a problem. So I have the privilege to work with some of the best closure engineers on the planet. And just to give you an idea, uh, some of my colleagues are Mike Fikes, who built the Ambly REPL, which is a closure script REPL, into an embedded JavaScript core on iOS. So uh, that is a closure script REPL in your phone, like on a native application, or in your watch. Um, there will be a link in the, the sources at the end. Um, like my, my tech lead for my team, for our mobile applications and our VouchCore SDK, is David Nolan, who keynoted this event last year. So we have top talent, very, very, we have like the, the Bach and Chopin of, of closure. <laughs> and, but despite our talent and skill, no team is immune from like people process problems because all of the hard problems are always people problems. And so as we started to grow, we, we were experiencing these growing pains. When I had started a couple years ago, I had my hand held through the entire application. And I learned a lot, but that's not scalable. And when you have a very, very small team, you go from 10, 15 to 20, 30, you need a different solution. We have lots of talented musicians, both literally and figuratively, but we were out of tune. So back to a mu music metaphor. Even if you're a very good self-taught guitar player, like you very good at playing Wonderwall at your cousin's birthday party, people love it. That doesn't mean that you are a composer of music. It's a completely different skill. So we think about what is a composer. Like what distinguishes a composer from an amateur musician? Because being a musician is a very broad term that encompasses performers of music, instrumentalists and singers, maybe like authors of code. Um, you also have conductors of music that can lead groups of musicians to success and keep them in sync. And we have composers of music like Chopin or Bach. And you can think of that as almost like the architects of a system. So what is the difference between these roles and responsibilities? Well, when it comes to music, it's music theory. And music theory is what's required to be an effective composer. It's understanding how music works. It's the laws and the rules and the principles that govern how we create, perform, and listen, and enjoy, and attach meaning to music. But it's, it's knowing music theory is not required for someone who simply seeks to play a cover of Wonderwall at a, at a cousin's birthday. And so math is a very important part of music theory. Um, Music theory is all just math under the hood. So this is the reason why when you get a Taylor Swift song stuck in your head, you can't seem to shake it off. Thank you, thank you for the laugh. <laughs> so, everybody take a gander, take a look, see if maybe you're going to recognize something, a pattern perhaps. What, what is this pattern, dude? Does anybody recognize this? Yeah, yeah. Golden ratio, also known as uh, Fibonacci sequence, um, as seen in, in nature. So each, each number is the sum of the two preceding ones. So these are seemingly unrelated things, right? We have a, a shell and a sunflower and a twig. But we recognize the patterns as humans. But, but why? What is the significance of patterns? Well, humans, and when I say intelligence, human intelligence and almost like consciousness, we are primed to recognize patterns because once you recognize patterns, you can repeat them, and that's how we learn. Before, remember when you were a, a baby coder, before you knew how to write code, you probably knew how to copy and paste code and do it until it worked, right? <laughs> Just. 
So, speaking of code, <laughs> Um, here, I've created a closure namespace that represents a fugue using a closure multi-method. I'm going to pause. Can, can y'all read that? Is that readable? Yeah? Okay. So first, we're defining the subject. Remember, the subject in a fugue is, the, is just, I just did it as a, as, as a sequential data structure with the chords. We're making some um, allowances here. So, um, so this is a multi-method, which is just a, a type of generic procedure that can behave differently based on the values of the parameters passed to it. So here I've defined a subject of a composition represented as a sequential data structure of notes. We have def subject A, D, E, A. And then I define the multi-method here, def multi play, and then the, the parameters, and uh, then all the def methods are, uh, depending on what we pass it, huh? there we go. We can determine uh, what to do to it. So, so then we have the, if, if we call it with the default, it's just going to play the subject. If we call it with the, the keyword retrograde, then it will play it reversed. Remember, like the Bach? Uh, we can also maybe transpose it to a minor key. Uh, and this is uh, just for fun. Did I need to include this? Probably not. But did I want to <laughs> code up a crab cannon uh, Mobius strip as a multi-method? Yes, I did. So here we are. Um, and so it finds half of the subject, and then it, it creates a list of the first half, and then it isolates the second half, reverses it, and then it just concatenates them. So then here, in the comment, bo comment block below, I've uh, just evaluated the, uh, from the REPL as a comment, just so you can see. So play original, and we call it with that keyword default. It's just going to give us the normal. We play uh, backwards, and we call it re retrograde. It will reverse it. To minor key, you see it will attach minor. So uh, the thing is, as you can see, like fugues and canons, it can get very complicated, right? And the thing about patterns, though, is you don't need, when you hear music, you don't need to think about the complexity within to be able to understand the beauty in it. And that is because of the patterns. So whether it's music or art or nature, our human brains recognize patterns and, and, and find meaning in patterns. So, speaking of patterns, let's make this even more fun. Does anybody know this book? Douglas Hofstadler. Yeah? Did anybody finish the book? I think you're lying. <laughs> that is my hypothesis, that anybody who says that they've finished it is just lying, but nobody else can call them on it because nobody else has finished it, is, is, the, is my... Uh, but I'm going to... Uh, and I did. I listened to I'm a Strange Loop. That is also... I actually think that is a better way to engage with the content. But... Um, well, just like you, I haven't actually finished this one either because, like, this is heavy. <laughs> you can fit so many strange loops in here. <laughs> but, okay, among other things, the book discusses how systems can acquire meaningful context despite being made of meaningless elements. So, chapter 11 is titled The Location of Meaning, and Hofstadler actually uses Bach and Cage as juxtaposition as a uh, concept to illustrate the, the, uh, the difference between chaos and order. So he argues that if there is an information seeker who is searching for the location of meaning of a message, that we have at least three distinct levels of understanding to consider. So from outside to inside, 
Let's see which, which direction. From outside to inside. We first experience a message through a frame before moving on to the outer message and the inner message. Now, the outer message and the inner message, they can actually be, um, there can be many levels of that, but for the sake of simplicity, uh, we are going to consider the three. So, the initial, the frame. So the frame indicates to the seeker that there is something worth recognizing, that there is, there is a message within, like a message in a bottle. You see it and you're like, okay, clearly there is something in here. Like, hey, there's a message. You kind of want, you might want to check this out. So because closure is a dialect, dialect of Lisp, a Lisp processing language, if you are interested in recursively processing lists, maybe you should check it out. And that's the frame that we can experience closure through initially. So, outer message. This is my favorite part. Because this is the part that, as humans, we have the most control over. We have the most influence. Because to build an outer message is to build or to know how to build the correct decoding mechanism to understand or appreciate the, the inner message. It's like a decoder ring. So an outer message is pure, it's side effect free, and it is self-contained. It does not mutate or directly add to the inner message. And it's also, it's implicit. So it's not spelled out directly, which means that there is a risk that it is not recognized by the information seeker. The worst case scenario, an outer message can be so bad that it like perverts the inner message. That's like, don't do, that's the worst case scenario. So, so here, so closure is a dialect of Lisp that actually compiles to Java, and then we also have a, a closure script compiler. That's actually what David Nolan works on. Um, and so, when it comes to closure, the outer message, the outer message is the reader and the compiler before before it gets sent and compiled to the JVM and actually does the things you want it to do. The outer message is the reader. That's why you can do things like um, there are certain characters you can use to directly talk to the reader in Clojure. Um, so if an outer message is good enough, the inner message should actually be able to be thrown away completely because you can always, like you can, you can throw away the compiled source code, and we do, we tend to, we will just remove that, and then when you compile it again, you get a new inner message. If the outer message is so good, you should be able to repeat that process. So then, we have the inner message. So this is the actual content that the information seeker is after. So if the information seeker is a computer, the inner message of a closure program is the compiled Java or JavaScript code. And like I said, there can be many levels of the inner and outer message. You can kind of go in a couple of circles there, but we're, we're keeping it simple. So wait, what does this have to do with documentation, right? Back, back to the story, what's going on here? Interesting side quest. So the Vouch team is we are altruistic meaning that we want to help one another and appreciate and recognize the, uh, the message within, which in the case of a company, maybe like the, the value prop, like why does your product exist? What is it doing to the world? What is the side effect is it is intending to have? Because unfortunately, the worse you are at composing this outer message, the harder you make the information seeker work. And we call that friction. Everybody hates friction, right? Like, <laughs> talk to your product manager about friction and you will get <laughs> a lot of opinions. So much like we see that music theory helps composers recognize the rules of music, maybe we needed a, a pattern to unite behind so we could improve the outer message of our code. But how? Well, Back to the story. So to protect the inner message, and in this context, it is the code base, we needed to adopt a decoding mechanism that was, that was universal and, and uh, 
universal is, is generally beneficial. Um, that way, all the information seekers, whether it's the people on our team internally or the people, our external clients, you know, could have a helping hand and be able to appreciate the, me the inner message. So, I wasn't sure how to solve this problem, honestly. So I started by just asking everybody, what's your favorite documentation? And what did I do? I analyzed for patterns. <laughs> and because I'm not the first person to conquer this issue, I also looked into the frames that other people had developed. The frames that other people develop, you might know them as frameworks, Pew! right? <laughs> and wouldn't you know, I found some consistencies, some patterns. So I did, I found the uh, diataxis framework, which consists of four, four semantic chunks that is based on the needs of the, of the reader, of the user. Let's, so this split, it helps with, this, uh, with the levels of tolerable complexity and it kind of gives us a basic rhythm. I'm going to explain a little bit about diataxis. So, tutorials, they serve our study, they help us learn, and they contain practical steps. And practical steps are one, two, three, four, something you follow in order, right? Um, and tutorials, the, the, the purpose of tutorials are to uh, inspire the learner with, with confidence. It's like when you teach a child to cook. A, a five-year-old child, uh, you get excited, like, hey, okay, we're going to make a carrot cake. And you set them up in the kitchen, and you say, you say, okay, this is how you wash your hands, and this is how you set up the cutting board, and this is how you hold a knife safely. And they cut, like, two carrots, and they get distracted, and they run away. <laughs> Did they help with the cake? No. This was to help their study. But it did give them the confidence that next time they go into the kitchen, they are confident they can next time maybe they'll cut a zucchini. So that is what study is, versus a how-to guide. That contains practical steps as well, so one, two, three, four, but it helps our work, it helps us to get something done. Uh, a how-to uh, a good a how -to guide is like a recipe. It's going to assume that the user has basic competency versus a tutorial assumes the reader knows nothing. Like a hello world is a good, a good tutorial. Um, so how to guides. They contain practical steps, one, two, three, four, five, and they help us get something done, right? They're assuming that we're competent. Then we move on to reference. So reference guides, I am always able to identify because of identify a visual pattern. It's usually like a table or, or a, a they call it with the, uh, it's like a, like a map with pointer, you know, it's, it's a visual representation instead of text. So a reference guides helps us get our work done, but the knowledge is theoretical, right? You don't, you don't, uh, you don't need to follow it in order. You can, you can look at a, a, like an API chart would be a very good example that you're just looking, you're going to go in like, oh yeah, what's this in point, what's this in point? Okay, done. And you don't need to consume it in order. Um, and then we have the last explanations. That's for, that's for background. I call those like the, the 4 a.m. Uh, like YouTube rabbit holes that you fall into. You're like, what is the Baroque period? That's actually the musical offering, one of my rabbit holes. You're welcome. <laughs> so, all right, the story. I, I found the solution, I found this, found this framework. It's, it's awesome and on the, oh, did I include it in the sources? I hope I include it in the sources. It's Diataxis. Um, it's, it's pretty well known, so problem solved, right? I just, I just link it in the Slack and everybody will adopt it, right? No, no. How many of you have tried to get your team to adopt or even just read anything by just sending them a link in the Slack? Did it work? Hmm, nah. So, um, in my, so, the Miller Principle. <laughs> no one reads anything, <laughs> ever. Not your docs, not your specs, not your comments. 
and there's a very high likelihood they didn't even click on your link in the Slack. So in the closure spaces, Alex Miller needs no introduction, but I will uh, fill in a little bit here for you. Um, he's not only the nicest person that you'll ever meet, but he's a very long time contributor to Closure Core. Um, he writes a lot of the documentation, and he's just, he's the one that answers the questions in the Slacks and actually cares about our, our users. Um, he's also a conference organizer, and uh, maybe you've heard of his, like, his little, little conference, Strange Loop. Yeah? Um, get your tickets. This is the last year. Um, so, Alex is a, a friend and a mentor of mine, and yes, this holds so true. Nobody reads anything ever. So how am I supposed to get my team to adopt this framework? I, I don't know. Well, in that retrospective, um, something else we heard is that like, so we are a globally distributed company, and we work across time zones. And we, a lot of us are based in Europe, um, as you know, value the work-life balance. And so when it's uh, time for dinner with kids, it is time for dinner with kids. Um, so meaning we're not typically overlapping at the same time. But just because we are remote first doesn't mean we don't want to spend time with one another. So something that we got in the retro feedback is that people enjoyed hanging out and they wanted to do more activities together. So uh, I had an idea. Documentation festival, yeah. So <laughs> this was a series of workshops that I led internally. And uh, I think it ended up being, we did it in very small groups. So I ended up doing eight different sessions across the team. Um, it was four hours long, that's like with breaks built in. Uh, like three to six people per session. And it contained like a 45 minute like talk on diataxis and what it is and kind of, uh, I give you a very short version here. But, um, and then it did like three collaborative comprehension exercises that um, it, it was fun. We got to hang out with one another. And it, it was great because it, it, it recursively improved because I did, you know, surveys and things. So uh, I, I did it eight times. The person, the people that took it in the first group, the last session was very different than the first because of being able to listen to what people enjoyed and what was too long, what was too short, and what worked and what didn't. And if you took that workshop, maybe you thought it was about diataxis, but this is a real slide from, from the intro. You know, the intro slides and nobody ever reads. Um, the intention is that we are here to participate in an experience that gives us a shared understanding of how to produce high quality documentation. So the real intention of TalkFest was to build, help us build that unite on the outer message, build some sort of shared language that could be our decoder ring. And just like the knowledge of music theory heightens the listener's understanding of a musical composition, such as the musical offering, I was hoping that this new pattern that we adopted would, would heighten our engineers' documentation experience so that we could communicate with each other and, and have less friction. Because, well, again, we hate friction, right? Ugh. But there is a risk because remember that outer message is implicit. It's not, I mean, I tried to spell it out with the diataxis framework is very direct, but there's a risk that it's not um, appreciated. So, Time to get your OKRs and your KPIs and your, <laughs> your objectives hat on because I would ask, like, how do we recognize success? Like, how, what are some of the indicators that we know that DocFest, Documentation Fest, I will say it as DocFest, so you know. How do we know that DocFest worked? Uh, I'm going to call on somebody. Katya. <laughs> huh? You? Yeah, yeah, less, less duplication. Yeah, yeah, because of improved communication. That is, that is uh, 
we're, we're not going to get as much, uh, I don't want to say irrelevant code, but it is kind of irrelevant if it's, uh, if it's been duplicated, yeah? Was there anybody else that had, uh, no? Okay, what, yeah? Okay, well, I have slides for it anyway, so yay. <laughs> so, I mean, one of them is even on the slide. It says onboarding, y'all. It says, it said it, it said it right there. <laughs> So, there was a, yes, we had shorter time onboarding, and uh, from when I, when I onboarded, months, it was, it was, you know, handheld through the entire application, but, um, you know, we had these newer engineers, and they were able to find the newer resources, and because the documentation was written in a way that uh, the comprehension exercises in DocFest, one of them was to force yourself into the seat of the reader, right? Like we kind of created these personas and then thought about what a person at the skill level would want to know because that is a way that we mess up documentation. Um, if somebody, it's that difference between tutorials and how-to guides of if somebody has competency, they are not going to be thrilled with a hello world but if somebody is brand new, they're not going to be able to appreciate, uh, they don't have the basic competency to appreciate a how-to guide. So, shorter time onboarding, that is one of, the, uh, one of the things we saw. We also just saw like new artifacts completed. So after, Doc, after DocFest, uh, everybody kind of like took responsibility for a uh, thing that they were going to write, whether it was a tutorial or how-to. We used the personas that we created um, to, you know, the, the, the prompt at the end was to write a piece of documentation for that persona that we had created together to force yourself in the shoes of the audience. So we saw um, 19 new documents completed. Um, so that was pretty cool. Like, brand new, brand new pieces of information that did not exist before. Another surprising things we saw is that we saw features integrated more quickly, and this kind of has to do with what um, he was saying about uh, improving the comprehension of the code. So uh, we had a big feature branch, right, that somebody worked, um, worked on for, for a while, and I don't know if you ever get a PR and you see, ooh, 56 commits. 14 files change and your eyes just glaze over because you're like, what? What is the relevant? What is the interesting part of this? And what is a updating the, the dependencies? Um, but alongside the PR, because we had this new shared language, the author, Vinny, was able to also attach a piece of documentation, a reference guide, with the new endpoints that were created in this feature branch. And so, it was, uh, so it helped us build our features more quickly because we were able to actually appreciate, you know, you, you read the reference guide first and then you can just, you know, a linter is going to catch syntax errors, right? Um, so it, uh, it helped us. So I made promises in this abstract of uh, how to find the right rhythm for your software composition, right? I should answer that for you. But the thing is, each band is different. You are all on your own, you have different bands, and so how, how can you replicate this? I'm not going to say that everybody should just throw documentation fast at their company. Every band is different. Everybody needs a different solution. So, I say to consider the outer message that you've provided, and also look at the inner message that you're trying to communicate. So that's the, that's the code. The, so the outer message, we can put, consider like a spectrum and we can look at, our, look at the documentation that you have, whether it's a readme or you have a wiki or what, what, whatever technical artifacts you have that are supporting and existing alongside the code. Um, so yes, think about your team people practices. Are you all writing, do you have any shared language at all? 
Um, how good is your, your outer message? Is, is everybody doing their own thing? Or are they playing together? And then we also want to look at the inner message. So look at your code base. And this, this one, the, the, this is not good or bad, right? Like law and chaos exist on a spectrum that is neither good nor bad. Sometimes we solve very complex problems and it requires complex solutions. Um, but we need to be able to be cognizant and understand whether our code is conventional. Does it use a framework appropriately, like the right way? Um, is it well organized by namespace or, or is all of the code in like one file? I don't... <laughs> um, so then we consider these spectrums we can put them as on a sort of like matrices, right? Uh, we can start to visualize maybe where we are and then where we want to be. So I'll, uh, I'll show you some, a couple of examples. So this is like, I know the text is small, sorry. Uh, this is the best case scenario. This is that your documentation your outer message, you, you have that established. There's some sort of shared language that your team has, has adopted. Um, and that your code is also very organized. So uh, open source projects are very good, you know, oftentimes very good role model of this, or like I would consider like a, a unicorn developer team that have been working together for a very long time and they have these processes um, designed. Um, you have these, this documentation that is optimized for the human experience, um, meaning it's not in org mode. Like you, you, you want to write it somewhere that everybody can appreciate it, even though org, you know, using like Emacs org mode is good for the author, it's not easily consumable, right? So it's not universal. Um, you have things kept up to date. You have a, a spec or a schema, or if you uh, strongly type language, I guess you're kind of forced to do that, but in a dynamically typed language, you would uh, need a spec. 100% test coverage, yes, the dream. Um, and that you've also extended the syntax with uh, doc like documentation strings in the code, uh, metadata where it's appropriate, and you've prioritized code readability over, over complexity because there are often many ways to express logic or technical thought. And the things that feel the best to write are not the best to read. <laughs> um, oh, we won't talk about closure transducers, but that is. <laughs> okay, so in the middle here. This is where most of us usually are. <laughs> we have uh, documentation that is in between individualistic and universal, it's okay. And we have code that is also kind of in the middle, it's in the middle. I call this good enough to start up, right? A readme exists, it exists, it has some essentials, I wrote a script, you can run it. <laughs> you have some important test coverage. Um, and maybe it was your first time using this framework, so you didn't quite use it appropriately, but it follows most of the conventions. So then we have also, we have um, <laughs> research and development. <laughs> Moving fast, breaking things. And, and remember this code here, this is not good nor bad. You know, sometimes R&D requires you to be fast. R&D should maybe, if you're doing rapid prototyping, maybe you shouldn't stop to write the documentation if you need to be rapid about it. Maybe it won't get adopted. So there we have uh, individualistic docs, very complex code, no docs, no test, no style. It's just wild, right? So this actually I expands into, um, and I'm not going to read everyone, but your goal of how to replicate is to find where your code is and, and, and look at your people processes in your documentation and, and see how that has evolved. Figure out where you are now 
and where you want to be, and then make a change based on that, right? Um, so here's a little, little fact about me. If you've ever seen a closure meme, I probably made it. It's like I'm just big, big into the meme, closure meme world. Um, and so to stay on brand, I couldn't take this entire presentation to go without at least one meme. So I will present the alignment chart of technical documentation. So we have our docs that uh, if something is very individualistic and self-serving, if you are taking notes in your personal note app, if you documentation, your personal note app, you are evil. Why are you doing that? You're not helping anybody but yourself. You know, maybe this docs could also be called selfish and unselfish. That does another word. Um, and then with code, like with, the, like with the music, we have lawful, which is like Bach. And we have chaotic, which is like John Cage. John Cage was still, it, it's not good nor bad. He was still uh, very significant in, in the, uh, you know, in music theory classes, I know they teach John Cage, even though it doesn't sound like music to us. It's still a very important part of music history. So how do you find the right rhythm for your software composition? Well, if you ask me, I think it usually requires a team to come together right now, over me, no, um, come together to unite around a shared frame with your team. Okay, done. Yay, crowd goes wild. Woo. Did that work? Yeah. Okay, so here are two QR codes. One of them is with the sources. Um, and one of them is if you just, I'm, I'm places on the internet. If you want to see the places on the internet that I am, I, you know, do YouTubes and talks and Twitter imploded. So I guess that's not a thing anymore, but my memes are on there. If you want to go check out the closure memes. Um, and I think we have questions or are we, yeah, or, you know, what, how are we feeling? Did gay, nay, eh, guy? <laughs> we definitely have time for questions. Yeah. I, I, good. Did I even finish the... It's good. Does anyone have any questions? And then prepare, because I am going to start asking you all questions. Uh -oh. So, <laughs> get, ready. get ready. Hey, thanks for the presentation. Um, yeah. In fact, I have two questions. One yeah. is, uh, how is your experience of like documentation that have rotten over time, you know, like things changed and people also often forget to update the docs. So I don't know, six months later, someone is doing something and they realize that things are not working. Mm -hmm. And the second one is more like a curiosity. Uh, you said that you organized a bunch of doc fests, but you also said that your team is uh, all across the globe. So how do you do those fests with everyone in a different time zone? Okay, I think I understood the second question, so I'll answer that one, but I think if you speak um, slower on the first one, then I can understand. But uh, the, how did I do DocFest when we are globally distributed? I got no sleep, is what happened. <laughs> like I, <laughs> I woke up at 4.30 for the Europeans, because I live in the United States. So yeah, I just, I got, I got, I got no sleep. Um, and we did it virtually. Um, we, I think, I believe we used, uh, I forget which video room, but yeah, for, virtually. It would have been better in person, but globally distributed. Uh, something that I did change as it went on, like relevant to that, is I had started DocFest kind of by team or by like product or repo or whatever. And I realized that one of the values was mixing teams and spending time with like, like Vouch, we do, one of our things is we do everything from hardware to software to everything in between and that we design the hardware and the firmware and the software. So we have many different uh, people doing different things. And the firmware team, they didn't need to spend any more time together. 
But like, if you, if you, I took one person from each team, then they were able to communicate, you know, able to communicate in that way. And so that's, I don't know, just relevant fact I thought of that your question made me think of. <laughs> and the first question. Um, the first question was, um, uh, imagine that you write some good documentation uh -huh. and then things change. Uh, and often the documentation simply rotten, you know, uh, like, how I know. do you, how are you handling that? Like keeping the docs up to date to the mm -hmm. change that you're doing to your systems? Mm -hmm. So DocFest was initially thrown as a, uh, so and this is something that Diataxis covers. Um, the concept is always complete, never finished. So, uh, and the way that we store documentation is we use Notion as a wiki, which is basically just a GUI on SQL. It's like basically just a relational database. So you were able, so I was able to like, you create a document and you can attach all this metadata to it based on like, you know, so you could see when it was, when it was authored, who it was authored by. Uh, and and I, I put in some automated things that after six months it would be marked as like, not as stable as you would think, like dubious, questionable, check to make sure that this is still updated. Um, and, and, and a problem that I am literally solving now, too, because this isn't always complete, never finished, right? Um, is our code is very complex because we write all of our business logic in ClojureScript, but then we will compile it to uh, Objective-C, and we will compile it to Java, and uh, that's like the SDK that we will serve our clients. And finding a way to meaningly, me finding a way to attach meaningful metadata in the code is a challenge that I'm literally working through right now, right? Um, and I guess another answer to that is DocFest happens once every six months. It's not gonna be another four hour endeavor, but just having the time scheduled for the team, because oftentimes the problem is documentation is not attached to somebody's like OKRs or their deliverables, right? Um, as part of my role, I've made it part my main deliverable. <laughs> um, and so I kind of round, round people up, but that I think things fall through the cracks, like uh, you were saying the problems too, um, when it's nobody's direct responsibility. I can't hear. Hang on, I'll bring the okay. microphone down. Um, so my question will be, did you manage to make it somebody's uh, direct responsibility officially? Or did, did you Did I manage to make what? Uh, writing and maintaining documentation. Uh, in your team, is it somebody's direct responsibility right now? Uh, that's question one. And uh, will it still, do you believe that somebody will still be assigned this responsibility when slash if you leave the company? Uh, that's question number two. Yeah, so that goes into, uh, that goes into an interesting field that is, uh, you may have heard the words developer relations and been like, oh, what's that? <laughs> or like you may have heard developer advocate or developer evangelist, all of these words as engineers, sometimes we're like, eh, I don't, what is that? Like, I know that I felt that way before. I was like, what is this, like, some sort of manager? I hate managers, like. <laughs> um, but something just in my career, I have found that because I have such good, like, communication skills and technical skills, and it turns out that's rare, I didn't realize that, but um, I've started a developer relations at my company. We have a lot of autonomy, we have a lot of freedom, we are very small still. And, uh, and so to even bring it to the attention of leadership and managers that it is a separate role, that it needs to be somebody's deliverable and responsibility, I think is very important. And within my team, now we have established that. Uh, so yeah, if I leave, I would assume just like anybody, if you're at a job and you leave, you know, you, if you're a good person, I imagine you work with your manager to try and say, hey, these are the things I was doing. <laughs> Maybe you want to assign that to somebody else. 
Um, but I think through the process of DocFest now, everybody has realized the value in having a, uh, a conductor. And that, that's, that's what it is, is, is I, you know, uh, I do engineering work sometimes, but when we were talking about the, the different types of musicians, right? We have the, uh, we have the performers, the instrumentalists, the people writing code. Um, I consider myself like a, like a conductor now, um, keeping people in sync. And once a band has a conductor and sees the value in that, they don't often back, you, you know, you, it, it's, it's hard to go back. So did I answer the question? Okay. Yeah. Does this work? Yeah. Oh, is there too much echo? Or, yeah. yeah, thanks for the talk, it was lovely. Um, <laughs> I, I have this dream, at least like at a, uh, where I'm working right now, where, where I would ask maybe uh, like all the developers that are working in the project, like how do you feel about, it? like just polling them from time to time and, and, and just making sure that the quality of the, of the documentation is like to everybody's uh, mm. content, like everybody's content with that. Like is that, is that like a relevant thing to I, do or like? I need to be closer to read your lips because I'm having a hard time hearing. Um, oh, that's better, yeah. Can, also, can I come and hang out with y'all? Is this okay? Like, <laughs> would you like a, uh-huh. Is, yeah, is there, okay, so the question was, is there value in asking people about the quality of the documentation? Are, are you happy with the, with the state of our documentation today? Like, these kind of questions. Well, I think you would have to assume that everybody is going to say no. <laughs> <laughs> that is the, the first, but, so it wasn't a, uh, so the first, the initial feedback came as we migrated over to Notion, so we were having some kind of tooling stuff, and uh, it was just in a retrospective we had. So it wasn't like the topic was documentation. It was the topic was like, how, how is your engineering life? How is your daily life? Are things working for you? And then there was a very clear theme of like, our documentation is inconsistent. We need to fit, you know, nobody, and, and like I said, it, I ended up, kind of creatively making a solution. But I think to be able to think of a solution, you do need to make sure it's a problem. You know, and, and if it's not a problem, does it need solved? That was fun. <laughs> Hi there. Um, Hi. What was your experience and ha do you have any advice on how to create these structured and lawful docs, especially when they're external to the code? Things like these how-tos and theories, mm -hmm. theoretical docs. Mm -hmm. So uh, my experience in that uh, I do create a lot of content, so um, like blog articles and YouTube, like I have a little bit of a technical writing background, but mostly um, it's mostly unstructured and just because I enjoy teaching and I enjoy sharing knowledge. Um, so I'll say I had like, my experience was a passion for knowledge sharing, um, but that's why it was important for me to, like not only did we ask, is there problem documentation? But then I really was lost. I'm like, I have no idea how to solve this problem. Let me just maybe ask other people. And like getting them to say their favorite documentation was very, because like I was able to analyze the patterns and I was able to like try and identify frames, right? Because like maybe diataxis, it is apparently very universal. Like that's why one of the reasons I chose it is because it is, um, I don't know, there are conferences for documentation and like that leads it, you know, it's, it's a very common frame. Um, but, hmm. I don't think I'm answering your question appropriately. Say it again, say your question again. So when it comes to um, documentation that is external to the code itself, things oh. like how to's, uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, not necessarily like 
how would I update this feature, but right. how would I use this feature, uh -huh. um, what is the theory, what is the reasoning behind this, mm -hmm. how and where could you even store that? Mm. Okay, so the location, it's, it's interesting because we've also, another really awesome key like indicator that I didn't include in the presentation, but I think is probably one of the coolest things. Is, okay, I'm not going to touch it. <laughs> is that, you know, some engineers just hated using Notion, just hated it, right? And that's fine. It didn't even work on some people's computers, but the tool doesn't matter. But because we had had this shared language, what somebody did was extend it and created a GitHub repo called like RFD, like Request for Discussions, and started having discussions that would then feed and inform like the explanation in the diataxis. So I don't think it's important necessarily like the tool, like the platform, and I think that people get very, very hung up and focused on picking the perfect tool. And it's, it's a lot like with like IDEs not everybody is going to agree on the same IDE. So if you are wasting time trying to get everybody on the same thing, it's not necessarily going, going to work. Um, how you need to measure it, I think, is by people's ability to access the knowledge, right? So when I say universal, it's not like everybody's using the same thing. It's like, does everybody have universal access to be able to appreciate it? Um, and as far as like how to write the content, that was covered in the, the bigger talk, diataxis. It's crazy that like, <laughs> turns out the guy that wrote the framework for uh, documentation wrote like really good documentation. <laughs> so that was pretty easy because <laughs> I just like, here, link to this site. What, what is scratching? It's this. Aha, I found it. Okay. Um, did I answer it yet? Yeah? <laughs> Does anybody else have any questions? Oh, and I think I have one more. I think I understand a further, an underlying question in your question. You're right. I do have a background in creative writing. There are people on the team that did not, that do not. They are very firmware, for example, like very, and they were able to appreciate the diataxis framework. And they actually appreciated that they're like, oh, rules, I'll just follow them, wonderful, thank you, awesome. So if, I don't know if that was kind of the underlying question. Yeah. Yeah, well, that was the per that was part of doc the persona practice. Is that was part of the workshop? Yeah. Hi, great talk. Um, Thank question. you. Question. So, what are the most common problems you see in documentation, mm -hmm. and do you think it's individual or is it a systematic issue? I think that most of the hard problems are are people problems, and. I think it has to do with uh, things becoming uh, rancid, or what was the word that was used, or outdated, especially when it's something that's kept outside the code, because arguably if it's kept in the code, it's easy to just be like, bloop, bloop, done. But when it's kept outside the code, things going stale is, is a big issue. And again, that is a people problem, because if it's not part, if your, your performance isn't being rated on whether you do this extra step what is your incentive to take time out of your day and do that extra step? Well, and how I guess I saw for that with DocFest, the incentive is spending time with your colleagues every once in a while and doing the activities. So like that's, I think, how solved for that, but it is a problem. Like I'm, I don't, my solution is not perfect. I just have, I guess, the story that, how I think it can be solved. <laughs> Um, it was two parts. Did I answer both parts? Yeah. Hmm. Hey, any more questions? Hmm? I'll go back down here too. Well, yeah, I think reading lips helps me. Uh, so I'm curious, uh, 
since you have a structured documentation right now and the onboarding uh, process is faster, how it exactly looks like? Do you still guide people in the beginning uh, or do you just um, show them the initial page with like index and steps to, to follow? How, how does it look like right now? So it's, it's nice, I was able, because all of these resources existed in the way Notion, it's just a database, it's just a relational database, so I was able to do, um, I'm able to like search it as a database and I created a page that kind of has uh, recommended for, you know, uh, a software engineer starting this, right? And what we found that is instead of when I joined, every single repository. I had to be like, oh, you need to, oh, okay. I, I basically would run into an error within like, like a Docker error. And somebody would be like, oh yeah, you need to check out this repo. And it was just like me, the, the experience before was me running into issues and then it was a very silly answer that somebody had to tell me. But now with a faster onboarding, I think the problems are, are I want to say more real, but there, it's not just, oh, you need to check out this repo. It's, oh, maybe you need to add this to your configuration pro file, let's add this to the thing, or, or it's more abstract questions about how the repositories relate, as opposed to, I have this horrible Docker error, what is it? Like, you know, it's a different, the quality of the questions has improved, and when the quality of the question improves, it can be answered in the Slack Discord. So that's another thing is, is and because you feel less silly asking it, because <laughs> it's a good question, right? <laughs> like, I feel bad if, I, if I'm running into a Docker or an abstract, like, hey, the text is red. <laughs> Will somebody help? Like, that's a horrible question. Nobody wants to go into the Slack and ask that. But when you have a real question, like, hey, I'm getting this specific error when I'm completing this step, people are happy to help and you're happy to ask. So I think that is a difference. Did I answer the question? Yes, thank you. Okay. Any more? Hmm. Okay, I think technically we have a few more minutes, but mm. I have I have questions for y'all actually. Uh -oh. <laughs> so there, I want to if we go back to this. I want to see if you all have success in in replicating this process in doing an inventory of your team's documentation, either the actual resources or the, the process that creates the resources, and a, an inventory of your code and how bespoke it is, how complex it is. Um, is anybody prepared to do this? To say where on that chart? our project falls. Mm -hmm. Just in like, you, it could be a general placing, but just, just practice thinking about each spectrum. And then, and then thinking about and being honest with yourself about, um, well, yeah, we do have a lot of uh, complex code. And we do have a lot of notes that are on one person's computer, or like, oh, a PDF, oh. <laughs> a PDF is, no. <laughs> That's actually what uh, started, a, a big indicator of there was a problem was our, a client was interested in our solutions framework and had asked to see our SDK documentation and there were like four different versions that were PDFs on different people's machines and nobody knew which one was current. <laughs> and like I think, you, I, I think we did get a call back, but it was close. <laughs> and now my deliverable is a dev portal, so yay. <laughs> nice. <laughs> okay, who wants to practice putting their thing, the putting one person? I will call on you. I will do it. <laughs> I am... 
drunk with power on this, on this podium? I've, I, I can do. Definitely complex code, because it was written by one person five years ago and then added to about, I think, a year or two ago, three more people joined onto the project and started adding to this one person's code, and it was their first Ruby project ever, uh -huh. the, the person. So definitely complex, the code. Mm -hmm. In terms of the documentation, I would say in the middle, because it's accessible by everyone, it's in Notion, but it's very, very, very badly organized, and there are maybe like three pages representing the same thing that when the new developers came on board, they all wrote their own documentation. <laughs> it's in a centrally accessible place, but they were like, oh, this doesn't make sense to me, got told to document it better. Mm -hmm. Instead of updating the existing documentation, all three of them at different times have written mm -hmm. their own version of how everything works. So. That, okay, it's funny, that is a problem, and that is a problem that I did not escape, FYI. <laughs> like, even last week, um, I had written something to help uh, update the firmware on a device. Like, I had written a thing because it needed to be, and a firmware engineer had written, and it was the newer engineer had asked, like, okay, which one of these? And yeah, because this is my job now, it was my job to like look and basically mark one as deprecated of like, hey, go look at this other one. And because Notion is a relational database, you can just link to the, directly to the other one. But that, that, is a, that is a problem, like duplicate, I don't know how to solve for it either, but uh, yeah, duplicate uh, documents. But, but hopefully it wouldn't be, if, if you have a shared language, there shouldn't be as many duplicates. Shared language? <laughs> yeah, I know. Everybody on the same page? Ugh. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, Coolia. Well, thank you. Thank you all for attending this talk and, and, and joining me. And it was very, very fun <laughs> to, uh, to be here with you. Thank you, Jordan. Mm -hmm.